Okay, so we are now recording. All right, good evening, everybody. Uh, first off, thanks, Lori, for uh, uh, leading the meeting last week when I was off, so appreciate it. Um, no worries. Uh, so let's start with our uh, overall vision and our chart. So let me share my screen here. <laughs> So again, the ECAC is uh, is meant to guide the town, uh, guide the goals for the town manager and the town, and also work with the community to raise awareness. And we do want to try to prioritize exponential change and exponential improvements, and try to work with um, more speed. Um, so you know, the people in the community, your help is very important and very necessary to drive this forward. In terms of uh, what our top pillars are and what were our focuses, we have the heat pump, uh, Andra looking at the region and state and what new um, policies uh, or what other towns are doing. Um, Dwayne on solar, Stella with transportation and Don on CPACE. In terms of ECAC metrics for myself, and I would also like to see some metrics for the five pillars at some point. Uh, the first one around the ECAC meeting, I, I, I looked at the video. We had 12 people, 11 people uh, the last meeting. Um, I think we're, we have opportunity to, to do more. I think this is great from what we've seen, but we do need more community participation. So people in the community, if you can share, continue to share this information. We have the education series. Uh, we do want to create more awareness, so really appreciate if uh, you can continue to be involved and bring uh, more people um, to this meeting. Uh, education series is something that we have uh, for today as well. Um, that'll be our second one for the year. Uh, and then I added the third one here on annual report. This was a recommendation from Anna that in the past that we've submitted annual reports in December, and our recommendation was to submit this in September, only because it would align with the town manager evaluation and town manager goals for the following year. So just took this as an action item uh, for me to remember um, on, on what we need to do next year. And then uh, open actions, I don't know if this was discussed at the meeting last time. I don't think it was from the video that I saw yesterday. Um, and Stephanie, you had some of these action items here, and I added the last one. Um, I don't know if you have an update on these, Stephanie. Um, Sorry, uh, no, not um, not today. I have other updates, <laughs> but not that one. Okay, okay. And then I added the fourth one. I saw the video, and there was conversation about aligning the CARP, Stephanie, with the documentation that you have to help prioritize how we prioritize and then help prioritize town manager goals as well. So we need to have a conversation separately about that. Okay. All right, uh, the next item on the agenda is to review. Let's, make, let's yeah. make sure we have somebody taking minutes. Steve, your turn. I think so. I was just looking at the minutes and um... I'm after Dwayne on the list. Okay. So I think it's my turn. So I just started. Thank you. And did everyone get a chance to look at the minutes from the last meeting? Okay. I had one change before I forget that I think I was listed as the note taker, but I'm pretty sure it was Dwayne. Yeah. 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 I guess Most I didn't update problem. that. <laughs> Thank you, Lori. And I did update it um, okay. in my copy. So when I save it, with the final version to post, it says Dwayne now. Also, I wanted to note that um, Stella will be here. Um, she just had to, uh, she's running a bit late. Okay. All right, can someone make a motion to move, accept the minutes? I move we accept the minutes. I second. Okay, uh, voice vote in no particular order. Allison? Yes. Drucker? Yes. Rose? Yes. Raghavan? Abstain. Roof? 
Yes. Frederick? Yes. Selman? Yes. Goldner? Yes. Okay, and it's approved with one abstention. Thank you, everybody. All right, let's open up to the public for comments. Stephanie? Okay, so if anyone in the public has any uh, comments, questions, please feel free to digitally raise your hand and I will allow you to speak. Okay, no one is raising their hand. All right, let's go move on to the next part of the agenda uh, and talk about CPACE. Wait, I thought I did that last yeah. week. Um, did. Oh. But, um, but I can give a very brief update. I, I did meet with the um, director of the um, uh, chamber um, earlier today. Um, she seems excited to kind of help us move forward with that. Um, I, I think she, like the questions that you saw, I, that I saw earlier on your little slide, uh, Vasu, involves some sort of database um, or how to, how to con collect a database for um, properties in town that might be, um, that, that might be likely candidates for um, some sort of rehab using the, the PACE program and PACE funding. Um, so she and I are gonna talk again, but she is, but Claudia is really excited about being able to help us out and having a, a dialogue with this, um, with me and with the committee about moving forward with the uh, development community. That's that's the only thing I have to report since last week. Thanks, Don. Yeah, I, I noticed that you we talked about CPS and transportation. Well, we didn't talk about transportation last week, last meeting. Um, Don, do you need any help with on pace? I hang on. I mean, I'm I'd always welcome help. I'm I'm trying to get some time to get together with Stephanie since I think. The one of the things we talked about doing was putting together some sort of summary information sheet that can be available um, in town hall for people who are going in um, asking questions about how to move forward, how to make applications to move forward for approval of projects in town. Um, and, and I've meant to do that, but I've been pretty busy and haven't haven't been able to reach out to her. So I'll try within the next week or so, Stephanie. John, if you just want to send me a few dates and we can just try to get something on the calendar, you can do that tomorrow. Yeah, uh, actually tomorrow I'll be in New York City. Okay, um, never mind. <laughs> can I, yeah, so can I, um, but I'll send them out Friday, even if you don't look at them until Monday, because I know Friday's a holiday. I'll so. see them Friday. <laughs> okay. Yeah, Don, and the other thing I would say is without violating open meeting law, there are other people in the committee who are interested in, oh, right. And so just I'm, keep that in mind as well. You can I, collaborate. I, you, can I, I, you can reach out. <laughs> Don't you announce anybody that. during this meeting. <laughs> <laughs> you can exactly. reach out. But you okay. can also work with um, any other person who's not on the committee. And I'm sure that there's um, yeah. people who would be interested and we just need to identify them. But, you know, that might be a really good way to really have a team. You know, Don, I could also reach out to Carol and see if she would just meet with the two of us. Because she may have some ideas. That, yeah, that would be great. So I can, I want to see her tomorrow. So I'll, I'll bring okay. it up. Yeah. Thanks, Tom. Mm -hmm. So, so I know the agenda is incorrect, then uh, I apologize. I didn't um, Stephanie, I didn't catch that. Uh, so I don't know, Lori, if you have updates on heat pump. Well, you're about to hear them at 5.30. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, 
other so, than that? Um, other than that, I, I don't think so. I, I think, um, I mean, I've been working personally to learn as much as I can. I've been reaching out to my own community in Echo Hill. We have a little Echo Hill energy transition list now. Um, so I don't know uh, that there's anything else to report. Um, I did speak with um, a bunch of different people. Oh my gosh, uh, Mike Simons today at Abode Energy, nominally for a uh, for a um, home energy uh, consultation. Uh, but I also took the opportunity to talk to him about just general stuff. So. Um, trying to figure out the best way to, you know, get the information to everybody. I think this series of, uh, you know, we already have a series of at least two things lined up. We're trying to get somebody for the, oh, I should announce that, right? For the 7th of December, I'm trying to find somebody to talk about envelope issues uh, from CET. Is that right? I forget where they were coming from, Stephanie. Yeah, and I, yeah, we can follow up, Lori, because I've actually made contact with them about the heat pump program. So I think it's this is the point now at which you and I can connect and I can share information that I've gathered from That's them. Fun. And I think we can start creating something that more would be formal. Great. Yeah, I'm hoping we'll have a community wide heat pump advocacy training and a bunch of other stuff like that. Um, but Stephanie, I know, has been working on that. So I'm really looking forward to that. <laughs> um, but okay. I think, you know, I think 530 will, will review this um, video. I did try to get the folks, I should say that the folks who uh, are in the video we're gonna watch are giving another live webinar, same thing. They do this about once a month. So the next one is November 17th, 16th. So if anybody wants to have an opportunity to ask Mike Simon and Loie Hayes questions directly, uh, go again <laughs> next week, you know? It, it'll be the same dog and pony show, but they'll be live and they'll be answering questions afterwards. Um, so it, it's, uh, it's the best one I've seen. I've been to a lot of these heat pump things and those guys are really good. So we should find a way, Stephanie, to advertise that as well to our community, just so people know if they miss this one, that one you know, is live, um, they can go to that one. Duane and then Andra. Yeah, just uh, um, something I learned about uh, heat pumps in the marketplace um, uh, over the last couple of weeks. Um, and this is not ab advocating for any particular company, but um, we did, I did have a meeting with a company called Energy Sage, uh, which some of you may be familiar with in the solar space, um, where they provide a um, low pressure uh, uh, opportunity to, for home, particularly for the home homeowner market to put in their information and get um, no pressure sort of quotes from a range of solar uh, installers, residential solar installers that are comparable to each other. Um, and there's no phone contacts. It's all by email until the, uh, until the customer um, engages with one of the, the, the uh, solar developers. So it's a, it's a, it's a mechanism market mechanism that has gotten some attraction uh, and some funding uh, to try to make it easier for residents to navigate the solar market. Uh, what I did, and they've been in that business for quite a while. Uh, what I did learn a couple uh, when I spoke to the company a week ago or so is that they are about to launch a similar um, uh, venue for heat pumps, um, which um, I think we all, and I don't, you know, again, I'm not advocating for the company, but just as a resource um, that this issue of, of uh, you know, just the barrier market consumer barrier of, of getting quotes uh getting comparable quotes um and and um uh it, it can is obviously a barrier um and uh they this company is recognizes that and is trying to do something similar to what they've done in the solar market for the heat pump market so Dwayne, do they do any vetting of these quotes? yeah yeah uh well they do vetting of the companies uh, okay. and and uh, uh, substantial vetting of the companies again I'm not advocating for them and I don't know the, the their their complete secret sauce but they do need to uh, and so and the quotes are and I don't know how it's going to come out with heat pumps which has some maybe some additional um, complications associated with it uh, in terms of 
you know, how it interacts with the house where solar is a little bit more straightforward in, in that way. Um, but um, what they do do, at least in the solar field, which I presume will be similar in the heat pump, is to uh, work with vendors and vendors agree uh, to provide quotes in ways that are consistent, transparent, and consistent so they can be compared one to another. Uh, where, whereas if you go out and do it yourself, you can get different quotes and don't know how to compare them. Right. So this is interesting because there are now other companies springing up too that I've ran into zero energy, uh, which is also now offering, they claim that the average homeowner takes between, get this, 50 and 100 hours to figure out how to convert their home, which I can tell you is probably an underestimate <laughs> from my own experience. Yeah. But um, but uh, they're trying to make it simpler, and they but they charge quite a bit more even than a Bode does. And I found a Bode to be Bode charges now 150 bucks for a consult, and I found that to be the best use of my money so far. Um, this, this company, Energy Sage, the customer doesn't pay anything. Yeah. Uh, they their right. their um, yeah their business model is they get that money from the um, right. From so the, the problem the, the problem with that is that I now here, here's here's where the real problem is. Okay. I have quotes from seven different companies for my own house, all of whom are on the mass save list of approved providers. There are no approved providers through Abode. Abode, you know, the, also vets companies, but they have none out in Western Mass because we're just not a big enough market. Yeah. So they have no providers here. So all we have to rely on the ones that mass save tells us are okay. Those providers have given me now over a dozen quotes, maybe 15 quotes that are all over the map. Most of them are, they would work, but they wouldn't really be anywhere near the best solution. Um, I only have two that are actually a good solution and only one is a really good solution and it isn't the one that Abode advised me to get. So I'm now working on getting the final, what I think will be the final quote from the one company that got it almost right. <laughs> So that's the problem, right? It's, it's that these companies are all good, but they're all used to dealing with furnaces and they want to sell you another furnace with a little bit of heat pump backup. Uh, <laughs> so it's, uh, and you know, only one or two of them knows how to do even a, just a simple ductless uh, conversion, you know, just uh, without over the, the one, I got one ductless quote that was for like eight tons of, heat, which would have made my house clammy and wet in the, in the summer, it would have been ridiculous. So uh, I don't know what they're thinking. <laughs> but um, yeah, so it, it, they don't all know what they're doing, I think, yet. Not the ones out here, they haven't done it enough. So what we really need is, is uh, you know, something like that with, with the quotes that are with some, we need Mike Simons to look at everything, basically. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So. Andre? Um, just one thing on, on <clears throat> that, there's, um, <laughs> did you all hear about the, um, Wellesley, um, well, some people are using the word blackmail, <laughs> um, yeah. to bribe, bribe, uh, sorry, uh, to, by, by the, um, gas company, I think they have. Oh, yes. National grid, uh, to, to let them to put into their, like, you know, zero energy, super, uh, plans to, to go clean in their buildings. Um, to put in that they will put gas. Sorry, and Andre, can you start? I'm not clear what you were talking <laughs> I'll about. I'll send out the, the, the thing, but it was sort of an outrageous thing where well, the um, gas company asked, he offered, made, made an offer that most municipalities wouldn't refuse um, that kind of um, completely undermined their, their um, climate action plan. Yeah, they, they offered millions of dollars of, of support for climate energy transit. I think it was a mil, was it a million? For yeah, energy yeah, yeah, but, but, yeah, but with but, the but, condition but, that they had, they would put um, in gas. Um, gas lines. Okay. In all new residences, something like that. Because those and are still allowed as of it, now by the state. It, it, it angered 
uh, legislators and um, activists to the degree that um, there's very serious discussion going on now about taking mass save away from the utilities. It was it was an offer that they made through the mass save program. Oh. Yeah. State perspective on mass save. Um, I wanted to mention that local energy advocates um, meeting next Tuesday, the 15th, will have a speaker from Renew Communities, which is um, a company that I believe manages and develops um, low income housing and um, has committed to um, doing clean energy retrofits for their buildings, their their communities. And um, they're gonna be on talking about all the bumps in the road that they ran into doing their first one in um, the Boston area. Um, and it, it was bumpy, but they, they learned a lot um, and they're pursuing it in their other properties. So, that's, Andra, can you tell us the date and time for that? It's the 15th. It's at seven o'clock. Um, and I can share the um, I'll, I'll ask Stephanie to send out the, the link, but you can also go on to the localenergyadvocates.org website. And, um, it will, we'll have the link there. <laughs> Thanks, Andrew. Stephanie, you had your hand raised? I just lowered it. I'm okay. Okay. And, and Lori, can we have, uh, you know, I think you're doing a lot of work. Can we have that in the in the slide that you can share next time? And I also want to, um, have we what? were talking, I know you were talking about the, we were talking about the town manager goals last week or the last meeting. And I wonder if we should start thinking about what should be our goals for the heat pump program? Um, and then that should possibly help drive what the town manager's goal should be for this heat pump program. If there's anything that we can drive. Yeah, so I mean, I think I think my goals are, to, my own goals are to continue this education series and yeah. then do what I can to help Stephanie get this heat pump advocacy program in place, you know, whatever, whatever help you need, Stephanie, if I can, you know, if we can encourage a town manager to 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 do what you're trying to do there, um, that's where our goal ought to be. Well, I think um, it's you know we have the funding, so yes. it's just a matter of putting it together. And that's as I reached out to this committee, you know, when we first got that ARPA funding, that you know, I'm sort of starting just having the conversations and trying to put something together, which is why I now want to bring Lori in because I'm at a point where we can discuss this more and then bring it to the committee to sort of let's make this, you know, a viable program. I, I do want your input and I want your guidance on this um, as well. So I'm not trying to create something on my own or by myself. Um, and I don't think it's a matter of trying to get the town manager on board. I think the town manager is on board. We have funding. And I think what we're, the one thing that I've heard from the town is that we want to get as much money for heat pumps themselves. So at one point we had talked about hiring staff to sort of manage this program, but now the approach is try to, to try to work with CET and work with existing programming and just sort of have an additional stream of funding to support the purchase of the heat pumps. And we especially want to target rental units and low income housing. So that's kind of the focus and the drive for that. So it's just a matter of, you know, having conversations and communicating. And as I go along, I will certainly be bringing you more information. Yeah, I guess my con was just not around, not only just the heat pump program, but we have five pillars identified. And I'm out of those pillars, what are we trying to drive? And is the town aligned with those goals? Can we add those goals as part of town manager's goals for the next fiscal year? And that will ensure alignment between what the town wants to do, what are we doing, and then how are we creating awareness within the community? We, we don't have that today. And, and that's, it's just for everybody who 
owns these pillars is to just think about what do we want to drive out of, you know, the heat pump program, the pace, and then what should the town manager's goals be? And we want to try to push an aggressive agenda to the town manager. And then they, the town can then decide whether that goal makes sense or not. Yeah. So I just keep going back to the 2025 roadmap. I mean, those are the, you know, those are the things that that's where, you know, the projects that we funded mm -hmm. for ARPA came from. So in my mind, those are the things that are in your pillars and the things that we're trying to address and move forward. Um, the, the fleet transition we have, um, I had a conversation. I, I don't, I feel like I could start getting into a whole other, like, um, staff update. So I don't, I'm kind of, I can hold this off. I could keep talking, but I don't know that I should. So I can hold off and wait until the staff update to say more of what we're doing. Yeah. If you, if you want to hold off, it's fine, Stephanie. I, I was just thinking through this after I heard the last meeting and we were talking about goals and the town manager's goals and the CARP is there. We can use the CARP goals, but we should all align. And this is a perfect time that we can push the town on what the town can do. So, uh, Lori? Right. Yeah, I just wanted to say that I think you're getting ahead of yourself on the agenda. And I'd really like to hear from Stella okay. and, uh, and the home rule petition from Rose. So, <laughs> from uh, and, right. okay. and, or rather, Andre. All right. Thanks, Lori. All right. Any other questions or comments on the heat pump program? If not, I'll turn it over to Dwayne for solar update. Yeah, it wasn't. It wasn't. I thought I was on the agenda, but then I didn't see it, so I not, not um, extremely oh, well apologies. prepared. And and I, I, truthfully, I didn't quite finish my homework either, uh, so I can just give an up a status update. Um, you know, my what I have embarked on since the last time was this. Um, uh, user friendly um, tool that uh, we as a committee and constituents can use to make their own uh, or, or do some assessment and evaluation of, of uh, how much solar it might make sense uh, for Amherst to try to host within its town. Uh, and um, uh, this goes somewhat in concert with the um, consultants work on GZA who we met um, I think at our last meeting uh, on the solar mapping uh, for this tool could be useful for um, anybody that would like to use it. Uh, but for us, I would like to use it to um, work together at, at, to reach a consensus of of, of some, some uh, say, low, medium, and high values to offer to GZA uh, as they're mapping out, doing their mapping to uh, provide a a um a sense of, of 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 what it might look like in the town to host this sort of low middle and high amount of solar capacity within the town um and so i do have um that tool if you will uh kind of in working order um and um uh what i what i don't have yet is uh confidence in sort of the base case assumptions that I want to put in there uh, as, a, as a form that we want to make available. Um, and, and, then, and then just the, the simple user-friendly formatting is not really there yet. Um, and so truthfully, that stuff's not that rigorous or hard. Um, uh, so I will work on that. Um, and um, uh, I know I can't collaborate, <laughs> but I can... Uh, get um, review, I believe, um, from some uh, members of the of the uh, of the group. So I will probably do that over the uh, over the interim course between now and the next meeting. And um, and um, I, I think we're in good shape time wise because GZA is not going to be ready for this uh, to receive this for a, a while yet. Um, but um, uh, but I'd like to sort of get that uh, up and going, and so. Um, whether it's next time, next agenda, ne next agenda, or the one after that, um, I think we'll be in good shape. Thanks, Wayne. Any questions or comments? Okay. 
All right, uh, let's move on to the next part of the agenda, the home rule petition. Uh, Andra? Okay. Um, <clears throat> I wanted to have a bunch of slides and be really fancy about this and um, didn't manage it. Um, but I um, want it to be clear that um, home rule petition is one of several ways that municipalities are trying to push um, the state to allow for new buildings to be um, <clears throat> fossil fuel free. Um, another way is by adopting the soon to be um, enacted program for a specialized stretch code, um, which doesn't get you all the way to net zero, but perhaps in practice would make it too expensive to actually put in um, fossil fuels. And um, so I, I can tell you about each of these. And um, the, a, a third option for us um, would be to at least make it clear that Amherst no longer is seeking more gas from Berkshire Gas, which is the current policy from five years ago when it, it was last a question um, and Amherst lobbied for um, undoing the moratorium that we're under. Um, and that's something that would just be a statement. Um, there's nothing legal we could do. Uh, because I don't know. I don't think so. I think it's just like a resolution. So it, 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 we could do all three of these. Um, so let me go into the home rule petition idea. You probably know that several of um, the very progressive and frankly richer towns have um, like Brookline and Arlington um, have pushed to be allowed to um, establish their own code for new buildings <clears throat> that would um, have rules that not necessarily an outright ban of gas lines, um, but um, pretty specific about how that would be done. And um, those did not pass in the legislature last year. There were, uh, I think, yeah, we were up to 10 communities that had requested this <clears throat> by, um, by the end of the session. Um, and instead, the legislature made this pilot program, which takes any community that has voted that they would like to have a um, no new fossil fuels in new buildings um, standard and um, let the uh, DPU decide um, how that could go forward as an experiment. So 10 towns will be allowed to do that, 10 municipalities. Um, those slots are going to already be filled, but we can still apply for it. We can pass a resolution. We can. Um, do both a home rule petition saying we want to do this legislature let us 
out of the state um, code and do it exactly the way we want. Um, and we could also say to the DPU, we want to have, um, we want to be in line and then pressure the governor to expand it to 20 communities. And then we'd have uh, the ability to do that. All of, all of these require us to state in clear legal terms, which other communities have already figured out how to say, so we wouldn't have to you know, rewrite it very much. Um, can you still hear me? You know, my, yes. My screen is gone. Um, and then uh, it, it, we, we could do any, any of these things, but the, the home rule petition to the stretch code opt-in. Um, and there's no reason we can't do them all. And we should really look at them carefully side by side and decide what, what actions we recommend. Um, and so the recommendation for stretch code or home rule petition would be going to the Um, Andra, we keep losing you. Uh, yeah, I know. I'm. I'm gonna have to get back in um, on my phone. Um, let me let me do that, and then um, I can continue. Okay. Anyway, that's a short update. Um, let me keep do that. Meanwhile. I thought the 10 pilot towns communities were already selected and realized Stephanie. No? Okay. I thought it was. No, in fact, some of them aren't even going to be eligible. So uh, they're encouraging more people to apply and just make the case that this is important. We all want this. Do it already and stop with the stop with the pilot program. Got it. Hi, the other one, the other Andrew will drop out in a minute. Um, yeah, the program doesn't exist yet, so no one can apply yet, um, but we could be ready to apply when it's, the DPU has set up the procedures for applying. Um, and there's no reason we shouldn't do it because um, what it signals to the state to our new governor, to the legislature, is that there is wide interest across a lot of municipalities. There's a lot of um, other towns and cities that are also um, preparing to do this. Um, so. Uh, Andra, I have a question. You brought up, um, you know, there are some affluent communities that are interested in this. I is there an impact to low-income communities as a result if we, you know, if we're interested? What are some of the cons? Yeah. Um, so after the Boston has passed their um, whatever it is resolution, yeah, um, that they would like to have this, um, their own particular way of going fossil fuel free in new buildings. Um, so they will be applying as well. Um, and uh, we can do the resolution and decide to hold back to allow Springfield or you know Worcester or some other um, community that would so it would benefit a more low income uh, and BIPOC communities. Um, yeah, we, we could play that in, in in real time because things will continue to shift. Um, if we get if we 
put pressure on the governor's new DPU um, to increase it, um, then you know, then then there's more room. There's more. It's not a zero sum game like it is right now. So, so is that what you're recommending, Andra? Then for us, um, I I think it's a little confusing, and that we should have it really clear in our minds so that we can bring it to the town council. Um, in a way that will make sense to them. And, you know, I would love to go ahead with all three avenues, um, the stretch code, the home rule petition, and a proposition saying we no longer require more gas from Berkshire Gas. But we need to strategize about it. So, and I, I apologize. I, I didn't think that, given the agenda, that we were going to actually have time to delve in, um, or I would have tried to prepare some visuals so that you could look at them side by side. Should we talk about that at the next meeting, then, Andra? Yeah, that would be good. Okay. And if people have particular questions that you would want to see side by side. That would be useful for me to know. Is there any reading we could do in the meantime? Um, yes, a lot. Um, I, I, <laughs> I, I can try to pull from several different sources the benefits of, of each. I, I think it would end up being best looked at as a table and then have some sources that you could dig into. Okay. Thanks, Sandra. Lori? Just wanted to say I'd love to see us do all three. Um, if I had to pick two, I'd say the home rule petition and the and the Berkshire gas resolution. Should we vote on it the next time we discuss? Or what we think? I, I think it would be great if we can. The discussion might lead us to more questions. Yeah. Okay. One important thing that I uh, found out last time from Andra is that you don't need a, you don't need to have a local building code in place to put a home rule petition in. You can figure that out. After you have home rule, you can build your own building code. Yeah, and, and the thing about the stretch code is um, we could say when you put it together, you know, that that's also waiting for um, a DOER to set up the whole process for how do you actually do the opt up. Um, and we could say, well, we want to do it, you know, just letting you know, as soon as you've got it, we're going there. And again, it's just all of these are signals to the market, to the politician that Massachusetts wants to go all clean in their buildings. Okay, thanks, Anna. Let's talk about it next next meeting. Thank you. And if there's any information that you want us to pre do a pre read, just send it over, please. Thank you. All right, we have 15 minutes, so let's move on to the next part of the agenda, which is around setting priorities for the council and the manager. Um, I don't know, Stephanie or Anna, do you want to jump in and discuss this? And I've just allowed you to speak so you can unmute. Thanks, Stephanie. Hang on one second. I'm just walking outside really quickly. Hi, everybody. Um, sorry about that. I'm at the spin studio to teach my class. Um, anyway, so yeah, I had sent 
um, a list after our last conversation, I had sent some information to Vasu and Stephanie that, um, uh, that hang on, let me start over. Y'all had referenced the annual report as a, good, as a better starting place for goals um, looking forward because they, uh, you had prioritized specific things from the CARP plan uh, versus just looking at the plan and kind of picking at random. So I looked at that list and sort of tried to uh, narrow down things that I thought might be doable in a year and that really fell clearly under the purview of the town manager as directed by the council. So um, there are some things that, you know, the town manager very well might do, but it may not, I'm not sure that it makes sense for the council to ask for it. It might be something the town manager does on his own. So he looked at that list and pulled out a few things. Um, Vasu, I'm on my phone, so I don't have them in front of me, but um, I'm happy to, if you wanna share them out with folks. Uh, and I'm hoping that there can be some discourse around this and some discussion on uh, whether those make sense, uh, whether there's things missing and keeping in mind that these are not, this is not a guarantee that I can get all of these into the goals. Um, and then I wanted to also just mention that obvious that for sure the the town manager would be working with Stephanie and with you all where appropriate on the actual implementation of these um, and that there were some things in the annual report that are much more clearly council directives that I will um, take and try to run forward with so that's that's the that's the quick and dirty version and I'm happy to answer any questions I do have to warn you though I have a, I have a stop in about seven minutes five minutes sorry So if there's any questions, happy to answer them. Yeah, Anna, let me share my screen. Uh, I just copied the email into a document. Thank you, thank you. Okay. So the ones in, um, yeah, so, so it's around buildings and you had renewable energy. And then there are some comments that Stephanie made, as you could see and the steel color. Um, and then, oh, I'm just sorry, I'm looking at your email. You had something in yellow. So questions in yellow. Yeah, so I had added a couple of my own comments and questions in as well as some things that weren't necessarily in the goals document, but that I thought might, um, might be worth carrying forward based on discussions that we've been having since the last time that report was written. So that's, those are the two things that are in there. Okay. Uh, so I just, this I, just, I just pasted what the yellow yeah. and the orange. Okay, all right. So I'll, I'll read the first one um, since you're on your phone. So the first one is around the affordable housing. Uh, so I can't see anybody on the screen. So please stop if uh, you have any comments. Yeah, um, I'm happy to also just really quickly add these areas were defined in the annual report. And um, uh, some of these are already underway, but putting them in the goals ensures that they maintain priorities for the next year. So I do know that some of these are already happening um, and that was a conscious decision to still include them. Yeah, I'm, I'm thinking about the right way to approach this. Is that, Do people want to read this information? Uh, I'm trying to see if I can see all your screens. Do you, wanna, do you want me to scroll through this and well, all the ECAC members, you can read through some of the comments here. Would that work? Stephanie? Um, so yeah, I just wanted to suggest maybe it would be helpful if this actually got included, forwarded to the committee and included in the packet. And I don't know if there's a, a timeline where you have to have their response by, but maybe at the next meeting, they could give you a response with having had more time to actually look at everything. I, I don't, you know, it's up to you. Sure. I just am proposing that idea. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that's fine. I, what I can do, I need to ask Michelle when I know that GOL was just starting to talk about the goals and the way that the process works is that the governance committee uh, sort of develops an initial round and then brings it to the council. So I think that that should work. But if I hear otherwise, um, what I may ask for is just individual feedback on them, um, obviously not deliberation, which deliberation would be ideal. So hopefully we can get to that next meeting. Um, but if, if for some reason this is moving faster than anything else has ever moved in town council ever, then um, I will, I'll reach out and let you know. Okay, I'll send this over to, actually, I'll send it to Stephanie and Stephanie, if you can forward this to everybody. Um, and then one thing I do want to comment here is take a look at the pillars that you have and then what Anna's added and see if it makes sense to add 
or remove some goals here to align. Okay. And question on, on goals, Stephanie, is the GHG inventory assessment going to be completed next fiscal year? Yes. So okay. um, the proposal, so we have an application in uh, for a fellow and they would be conducting the inventory over the summer of 23. So it would be done by the end of the summer. It would be done by August. Okay. So I have to jump off, but um, if folks would have any questions on this, uh, anything I can clarify, um, feel free to shoot me an email and and uh, we can we can talk through it um, one on one. So I apologize, I have to leave early, but thank you for talking about it and discussing it, and hopefully we'll get some good goals. Yeah, we'll we'll have an action item for next for the next meeting to discuss this. Anna. If it's thank possible, you. Vasu, is it possible to put it earlier in the meeting? I do usually have to jump off early and then go back and watch the meetings later. Sure. So if it's possible, that'd yeah. be great. That's Thank fine. you. Yeah. Okay. Bye, everybody. Bye. Uh, it's 523. We have seven minutes. Uh, I don't know if you want. Laurie, go ahead. Can I just make a suggestion? I think we didn't hear from Stella last week because she missed the meeting. But if there's an update on transportation, I'd sure love to hear it. If we have it, if we can do it in a few minutes before the before we start the uh, presentation. Yeah, we can, because there, there's definitely no update. This semester, I'm taking math for the first time in uh, 15 years, and also engineering, which I've never taken. So uh, basically, no. everything is just in like triage mode till December. But I registered for next semester, and I'll have a lot more time. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I will say, I don't know if I made this um, offer explicitly but i have meant if we're leaning if we're really leaning into the educational series thing which i think is great i can totally talk to my friend who's the transportation manager for the city of durham um i don't know if that would be helpful for people like a helpful voice for people to hear from because durham is like differently sized and kind of far away but she's really smart she knows a lot about buses a lot about bikes um, and she's my friend, so she would be willing to come, come talk to us. Uh, so just let me know if that, that would be of interest. And that's, that's something I can also do this semester, even in the midst of everything, because she's my friend. Yeah, and still, I also wonder if we should bring in tap into the conversation if we're, if we decide to have that, this conversation. Yeah, so TAC, um, I'm also happy to reach out to TAC. I just need a contact information for TAC because that wasn't clear from um, the website really to me. So if Stephanie, you could send me just the name of somebody um, and I'm, I'm allowed to, am I allowed to talk to them like that? Or do we need to invite them to the meeting? Because I'm also you happy can, to do that. You're happy to, you're more than welcome to reach out to okay. the members of TAC. Um, and you can invite them to a meeting. I mean, it sounds to me like you've already just set up a potential education series presentation. If you have a friend who yeah. has this information and then you want to bring TAC on, it sounds like a good educational Combo. opportunity for folks. Yeah, I mean, what would maybe be interesting, It act, what actually could be potentially cool is if we're trying for an hour for these educational things is a half hour update from TAC and a half hour like voice from another city if people think that would be interesting yeah i think that'll be good stella but i also wonder if it makes sense to have if we decide to do an education series of, on transportation let, let it be a, a sequential set of series if we decide to have that like the yeah. heap pump program we have the what and how and then next month we're talking and then the you know following month we're getting some additional potentially we're getting people to have a conversation about, right? And so maybe it's, you can think through yeah. what the sequence of series should be, and then we can have the next set of months just focused on transportation, for example. That sounds great. I can I can figure that out. Thank you. Uh, Stephanie. Yeah, I can also um, connect with Stella about the things that we are working on now with this, um, company Utilamark on the greenhouse gas emissions inventory for the fleet, for the municipal fleet. And it's the idea of setting up a 
you know, a lot logistical steps, you know, and this is just the municipal fleet. It's obviously not the entire community, but just sort of one piece of what's happening. And so I'd be happy to sort of connect with you about that. Yeah, I'd, I'd love to connect about that. Um, as I've mentioned before, I'm like very interested in the commercial side, like the heavy vehicle side of that, especially. Yeah, that's the big challenge, actually. Yeah. All right, any other comments? No, we have three minutes. Laurie, I'm assuming we want to wait for three minutes for people to join, right? Yeah. Okay. So is there anything else on the agenda we can? Do you want to do a, uh, a tech check? See if we can hear it and see it? Uh, let's not, because I have it all set up. And if I run it, I have to. <laughs> and I sort of did that earlier. So let's do that live. And if it doesn't work now, we're sort of dead anyway. So I could give you some quick updates. Good. Because I'm after the heat pump presentation. So just do it now. Um, and I can do it really quickly. Um, solar landfill ribbon cutting. I sent you all the invitation. It's happening on Monday from 1230 to 130. Yay. <laughs> it was only seven years in the making. So really excited. Um, and you know, if you all can make it, that's great. Um, when was that again? Th so Monday, uh, the 14th from 12.30 to 1.30, we're having the ribbon cutting event at the solar landfill, the North landfill, 740 Belchertown Road. But an invitation went out to pretty much everyone in their departments. So yes, there you go. Cool. <laughs> Thanks. So- Are they, um, they going to give you the scissors, Stephanie? Yeah, we're, we're looking for the big scissors. We That's don't actually right. own them, we borrow them. So we're we're trying to locate them. <laughs> All right. See if I we can give, I hope they give them to you to do the cutting. Yeah, I'm a little nervous because they're very sharp. <laughs> so <laughs> and they they're very big. big. So um, but that's really exciting and glad to be moving that forward. Um then something that just recently happened, which was um just kind of an off-the-cuff thing. The um facilities manager, as I've said, uh several times is located in the cubicle sort of next to me. And he reached out to me recently and said, hey, I wanted to include this sustainability statement in my procurement RFPs and RFQs because um, I keep getting these proposals that include fossil fuels. So he sent me something and then I tweaked it. And so um, I just want to very quickly, it's not very long, and I just want to read it to you. And the reason why we want to do this and include it, and we are going to include it moving forward in all of our procurement requests for, for building projects is because, A, it then will reduce his getting proposals that include fossil fuels, and two, um, it aligns with the goals that you all have put forth and the town council has adopted. So the sustainability statement that will go in all future procurement docs um, for our municipal buildings is the Amherst Town Council has committed the town to a goal of carbon neutrality by 2050. The Energy and Climate Action Committee's 2021 Climate Action Adaptation and Resilience Plan offers guidance on meeting this goal in the sectors of buildings, renewable energy, land use, and natural systems, transportation, and infrastructure. Projects that replace end-of-life equipment must adhere to meeting the stated goal of carbon neutrality by replacing fossil fuel systems and technology with applicable and available renewable alternative technologies. It's a great segue to the presentation. So there you go. So that's for, you know, the municipal side. Um, and yes, go go for it. <laughs> Stella had a question. Um, Stella. Yeah, uh, I think it sounds great. I also just want to float this. It's probably, we can't follow up on it probably right now, but I wonder if there should be, could be anything similar to that language about um, implementing like a maximum working temperature. Have I mentioned that before? Is that outside the scope? But I think maximum working temperature for any kind of like outdoor work commissioned by the town um, might be pretty important going forward as far as like equity and uh, justice and climate adaptation. Because right now, like as I maybe hear people here are aware, there's no like federal maximum working temperature. Um, so I think like the town, that might be an opportunity for for municipalities to show show some leadership. It could be something we could entertain, um, and I'd be happy to talk about it yeah. offline. It's not something I think that we we don't have anything, so we can't include it now. Yeah, totally. That's the short 
answer. Duane, quick comment and then- Yeah, just real quickly, um, just, um, I think I caught something at the end in terms of that it has to be sort of not fossil fuel, but renewable energy. Um, I, I'm not sure legally or whatever, but uh, it might be a little bit broader than that in terms of, I mean, I'm thinking of elect strategic electrification, uh, which is not technically or doesn't necessarily technically, uh, it does not always um, end up in the definition of renewable. So it might be renewable energy and, and uh, clean electrification or something along those lines. Okay. Make it All up. right. And we should. Yeah. <clears throat> Yeah, let's get started with our second yep. education series on, uh, well, first one now on, on heat pumps. And um, I, I see some new attendees have joined. That's great. And again, the intent here is to create more awareness. So, you know, if attendees, if you know other people who are interested, we would like to hear from all of you on education series or, you know, things that you want to learn, but also, you know, bring bring your family, friends, and and we we can't do this without you. So thank you for attending. And I'll turn okay, it over so to are, you. are seeing the heat pumps, what, where, and how much screen, correct? Yes, I can. All right, good. So, um, all right. So the presentation that we're about to watch was recorded, uh, it was posted and recorded from a webinar, um, a live webinar by Loey Hayes at the Green Energy Consumers Alliance and Mike Simons from Abode Energy Management. Um, I saw it recently and was really very impressed. I think a bunch of us, few of us, at least a few of us saw it um, live. And then I think the rest of us have watched it since then. Um, so the idea today is to watch this thing together and then have a discussion afterwards. We're not experts, but uh, we've all been thinking a lot about this stuff. So we may or may not be able to answer your questions, uh, but we will certainly be able to tell folks where to go if they have questions. So first of all, just a little bit of background. So a heat pump is a device that through the clever application of thermodynamics um, takes heat out of the air, for example, in the winter and puts it into your house. Um, it moves heat from one place to another, hence the idea of a pump moving water uphill, right? Moving heat uphill or from the warmer, from the colder place to the warmer place. Um, in the summer, it does exactly the opposite. It functions backwards like an air conditioner, pulling heat um, out of your house and dumping it to the outdoors. And like an AC, it requires some sort of a coolant or a working fluid to do this or a refrigerant to do this. Um, unlike an air conditioner, the same fluid is used in the winter to do the heating. So it just reverses the process of the air conditioner in the winter. Um, because it moves heat around, this is what I wanted to get at because there were questions about this when I saw this seminar and I didn't think it was quite adequately addressed in the seminar. Because it moves heat around, it can actually be more than 100% efficient by quite a lot. So you put a kilowatt of energy in, you get four kilowatts of heat out. It looks like it's making energy, but it's not. It's just moving energy from one place to another, like that pump, right? So it, it can be 400% efficient, which means that it costs 400 times, uh, four times less than an electric radiator to run. It runs on electricity, but it heats far more efficiently than an electric radiator. Um, so this is why they're inexpensive to run. So why do we care, right? Why do we care about this? We care about this because residential energy use, which is mostly for heat, is responsible for a very large amount of the greenhouse gas emissions in the country, in the world. Um, I've been trying to get numbers for this. And every time I look it up, I get something different. In this presentation, you'll see Loey Hayes, I think, calls it 50% of energy goes into residential heat. Um, I don't think that's quite right. I think in Amherst, the residential energy is something like 30% and nationwide, there are numbers that say it's 20%, but I think it depends what community you're in and how you're heating and where you are in the, in latitude, right? How cold it is. So, um, but it's a lot. It's a big chunk of greenhouse gas emissions, uh, not to mention uh, methane that leaks out of all of our furnaces, uh, which is much worse than, than carbon dioxide, you know, pound for pound. Um, so the idea is that we all have to be, you know, at the same time, electricity is becoming greener and greener, right? Uh, as we move to solar, as we move to more hydroelectric, as we move to wind power. So the idea is to move homes, what's critically important to meet, you know, both the needs of the world and the Massachusetts climate goals. Um, what's critically important is to move homes away from fossil fuel heating and to electric heating 
which means heat pumps. Um, the good news is that in doing this, there are not only environmental benefits uh, to your home, it's more comfortable. There's also possible substantial heat, uh, savings, uh, financial savings, depending on how you currently heat. Um, and ultimately it'll probably be necessary as the fossil fuel prices go up. Uh, it'll probably be a win to use electric. Um, and there are also really good financial incentives for installation right now. You can get you know, up to $10,000 to transition your home. Uh, you can get $15,000 in 0% financing loans. There's fantastic incentives out there. So without going on any more now, um, I'm gonna go to the presentation. I just wanna say that we'll give out these slides which have a list of uh, resources. The presentation you have a YouTube link to, but you don't have the links that they talk about. So I've made a list of them here. For all of these incentives and rebates they're gonna talk about and for all of the things you wanna do, you always wanna start by calling MassSave um, and getting a home energy assessment. A lot of the rebates, the $10,000 home rebate for transitioning your home is dependent on you having a mass energy, mass save energy assessment in your home. So you gotta start there. So is the financing. Um, there's also a page specifically for renters. Renters, of course, can't, you know, it's hard to put in a heat pump, but you can put in an air conditioner and get a rebate, put in a high efficiency air conditioner and get a rebate. So there's, there are different things that you're eligible for. And there's a page specifically for renters on mass save. Uh, Green Energy Alliance is where this video comes from and, and abode energy management. And they have fantastic websites with enormous amount of resources for you if you're interested in heat pumps. Um, Abode also offers a quote comparison and con uh, consultations. I took advantage of one of those today and can attest that they are fantastic. Uh, Rewiring America has a webpage that tells you about federal incentives uh, that are currently available for the same transition. Massachusetts has its own incentives, but now as a result of the Inflation Reduction Act, there are federal incentives as well. So um, let me go ahead and start the webinar and then afterwards we'll have a discussion, I think. Okay, so uh, I just need a moment to find it. It is here. And I'm gonna start right here. Let me just, oh, you know what? I have to reshare this screen because I forgot something really critical. So I'm going to stop sharing and then I'm gonna reshare because I just remembered I didn't do what I needed to do so that you all can hear this. Um, so share, share sound. Okay, share. Oops, did I share the wrong thing? Are you seeing heat pump basics? Yes, we can. Okay, so let me go ahead and start it and tell me if there's any problem here. Um, so on to heat pump basics. Mike, can you tell us what, uh, what is a heat is pump good? and uh, how do they work? Yeah, it's good. Uh, yeah, certainly. So with a heat pump, I think that uh, a lot of just to kind of begin to understand how they work, it's actually found in the name. Uh, so a heat pump works by pumping energy from one location to another. Uh, so an example of this that's commonly used uh, is, an, is talking about your refrigerator or your freezer. How that contraption works or how that appliance works, it takes the heat from inside of the box and then pumps that heat to the outside of the box, which would be into your kitchen. Um, so let's just say, for example, that you have your kitchen 70 degrees. You want your freezer to be 28 degrees. How a heat pump works in your freezer is they'll have really, really, really cold refrigerant. Let's say negative 15 degree refrigerant inside of there. It takes uh, hot goes to cold, so say the 30 degree air inside of your refrigerator goes into that very cold refrigerant and then it pumps that heat to the outside and along the way it pressurizes it and makes it hot and that's how the, uh, the hot air, uh, that's how the heat from inside of the box goes to the outside of the box. The same exact technology works with a window AC. How that works is it just takes the heat inside of your home as well as some of the humidity inside of the home and it pumps that energy and it dumps it to the outside. So if you're standing on the outside of a window AC, it will feel hot on the other end. 
So with a heat pump, it's the same exact technology, uh, but it's able to do heating as well as cooling. So in the winter time, it may not seem like there's a lot of energy in the outside air if it's zero degrees outside, but it is important to realize that zero degrees outside is a lot warmer than negative 50 degrees outside. There's still a lot of energy that could be uh, pulled out of that outside air and brought into the home. So unlike with fossil fuel-based systems where you're setting things on fire and just trying to capture that energy, with a heat pump, you're just using electricity to move energy from one location to another. And instead of a heating system being like 60% efficient, it ends up being over the course of the year around 250 to 300% efficient. Um, so it's really cool, exciting stuff, and it's helping people migrate away from fossil fuels. Great. And just like um, uh, your refrigerator doesn't have a place where it actually is bringing your air, you know, into the into the fridge uh, and then pushing it out again, there's no air exchange between the inside and the outside with the heat pump. It's just the refrigerant that comes inside and goes outside, right? Yep, you got it. Um, yep, so it's all just happening through like thin copper tubes is kind of what's uh, what's moving the energy from one location to another. Um, and the type of refrigerant that they're using is uh, uh, called R410A. Great. So just to recap, heat pumps don't generate the heat. They're just moving it just like these water pumps are not making water. They're just moving it from one place to the next. And I'll go on to the next slide if you're ready, Mike. Yeah. Tell us about how efficient heat pumps are. Yeah, so one of the, so it, heat pumps change efficiency depending on what the outside temperature is. So let's say there's 47 degrees outside, there's a lot more energy in the outside air than if it was say zero degrees outside. Uh, so one of the things to note is that say, as the temperature drops, the efficiency of the heat pump drops. But for most models, most like single zone and multi zone, they kind of are typically kind of on the scale of anywhere from like say 400% efficient or having a coefficient of performance of four uh, in kind of the more moderate temperatures, uh, but then down to say the single digits even into sub-zero temperatures, they still end up being uh, pretty much over 175% uh, efficient. So there is, uh, so compared to traditional systems, much more efficient. Other things to know in terms of heat pumps is there's a variety of different types. So we saw a photo before of a ductless unit, and that's uh, typically the most common in our region where you can just be putting them on a wall or on a floor, and it's really easy to retrofit most homes with one or two ductless units, and then you could even possibly be displacing a large amount of your uh, kind of fossil fuel use on the shoulder season. So sometimes when people are adopting heat pumps, they're kind of trying to do completely migrate away from fossil fuels. Other times when people are adopting heat pumps, they end up kind of getting a delightful cooling solution and then kind of don't need to turn on their actual heating system until January um, because you can just use the heat pumps as a partial home solution when it's kind of more moderate out. Great, and there are ground source heat pumps um, that's also called geothermal, but we're focusing tonight on the on the ductless models because those are the more um, uh, the more common. So let's look at some of the variations of what the ductless um, heads might look like. Go ahead, Mike. Yeah, so on the left-hand side, what we have is probably the most common type, where it's just a standard wall-mounted unit. Uh, so how that unit works is it's just going to be uh, kind of pulling in the air that from the top of the unit, conditioning it, and then blowing it down. One of the things that I'll be addressing in the comments is uh, is the some of it sounds like marketing, but these units are inverter driven. They're modulating, so they never stop kind of blowing and mixing the air inside of the room when they're running. So whenever you're calling for heating, it's just kind of constantly taking the air into the room and it's constantly blowing it over the coil and it's constantly dumping the heat into the room or removing heat and dumping it to the outside. 
Um, so they, they, for a lot of homes, it can end up becoming a lot more comfortable than what people are used to with their central heating system, where you have one thermostat or two thermostats and you're dealing with uh, day and night and north and south, and there's always gonna be kind of temperature imbalances. In the middle, uh, what we see is a floor-mounted unit. Um, and what's nice about floor-mounted units is one, you can kind of have the all the lines that's just dropping down through the basement and out of the house. Another thing that's really nice about floor mounted units is you don't have to get up on a chair or a step ladder to change the filter. Uh, and floor mounted units can also be like tucked behind like a little desk uh, so that you can kind of mask them a lot more. And then they also have ceiling mounted units where it's exactly as it looks, it's just kind of mounted recessed into the ceiling. A handful of manufacturers are making that type as well now. Great, and um, uh, you mentioned changing the filters. This is something that, um, because it's blowing air, uh, the heat pump head is constantly cleaning, you know, the dust, et cetera, out of your air. So you do need to um, just, you know, rinse those in in, in water and uh, and let it dry, and then put it back in. Um, uh, you know, maybe monthly during the during the winter, but I have one, and I've I've certainly left it for a whole quarter um, from time to time. Um, and the ceiling cassettes, they do need to. Some of them need to be accessed from an attic above, but some of them can be um, installed just from below as well. Um, what about the outdoor comp uh, the outdoor unit, the compressor, Mike? Uh, what's the space needs on that and other considerations? Yeah, so with the outdoor unit, um, the there's a few different things to know. So over on the left-hand side, let me just say that that unit looks big. And uh, that unit looks big because that home has a pretty big heating load. On the right-hand side, we see photos of, say, a small, like a medium-sized unit and a smaller size unit. So do know that uh, with the outdoor units, as far as spacing, it really does depend a lot about how, what the heating load as well as the cooling load is for the property. Another thing to be keeping in mind is that we're in, um, we're in Massachusetts, we're not in Bermuda, uh, so uh, we do need to deal with snow. Uh, so that's why on both of the photos we do see the equipment up on stands. Sometimes people are also mounting it on the side of the house. As far as the outdoor equipment, with, in my opinion, most installers have cut the install of it more or less figured out. There's not too many considerations, like you don't want to install the equipment right next to a dryer vent. You don't want to install the equipment where you can like see it outside of your window. But uh, so the, the only like big considerations is like, if you do have ice dams, it's like do not install the equipment directly where you have ice dams like forming on your roof because you don't want 100 pounds of ice slamming on the equipment. Uh-oh. We seem to have a uh, problem. Let me stop it and start it. Hmm. Well, maybe we should take questions this far while this thing is uh, reloading. What do you think? Let me put my camera open again. Um, but yeah, with the outdoor equipment, I oh, think that most of the installer base in Massachusetts really has it pretty well figured out. Um, and it can even be protected. It can be hidden underneath the porch. Um, so a lot of flexibility there. And the refrigerant lines Sorry. from the compressor to the inside heads can travel quite a distance, right? You could yeah. put in the, yep. Yeah, so depending if it's a single zone or a multi-zone, sometimes uh, there, there's minimum. So typically the minimum is like 12 feet, but with some, like the photo on the left-hand side, that, that, that person's property, he would have 250 linear feet of like line set length to be working with to be connecting the outdoor unit to the indoor unit. And on the photo on the right-hand side, it's a really nice install. They like did a nice, they matched the line hide cover with the, uh, the color of the exterior of the home. But uh, do know that 
there is also, if you don't want like tons of line hide running around the house on the outside of the house, they also do make contraptions called branch boxes where you can be running from the outdoor unit to a contraption on the inside and then from the contraption on the inside called the branch box, then you can be running all the ductless equipment off of there. So if you do need say eight indoor units off of one outdoor unit, you don't have like eight uh, eight line hides, which more or less looks like gutters running along the outside of your house. So some installers can do a really elegant job with uh, getting the equipment installed and commissioned properly. Great. Thanks. Um, so let me talk a little bit about why the heat pumps are so important uh, at this moment in time when we're, um, you know, we have a state law that the <clears throat> that greenhouse gas emissions have to be reduced uh, to virtually zero by 2050. And uh, in New England, half of our greenhouse emissions, or almost half of our greenhouse gas emissions, come from fossil fuels used in our homes. Um, and heating is, by and large, the, the largest source in our homes of greenhouse gases. So um, we need to find ways to get rid of those fossil fuels and electric heating is, at this point, just about the only thing that's uh, considered um, a greenhouse gas uh, free um, sort of heating. Um, some wood heating is considered um, greenhouse gas free, but not really because there's a lot of uh, emissions from that. So this is a, a, a graph from the Mass Clean Energy Center um, showing the relative greenhouse gas emissions from each of these different types of heating. And you see electric baseboard, oil, propane, and natural gas are all much higher than the air source heat pump, the ground source heat pump, and what they're calling automated wood heating. Um, and note on this natural gas graph, they're not including the fugitive emissions um, from the well heads, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so, when we green the grid, that is when all of the electricity is produced by renewable sources, we will see that um, the electric forms of heat are going to be zero emissions. Um, so that's what we're going toward and that's why um, electric heat is so important. And you can green these, um, uh, your electricity, electricity sources already if you subscribe to a, a municipal or a nonprofit program that connects you to 100% uh, clean electricity, which of course our, our group, Green Energy Consumers, does provide. Um, so that's why heat pumps are really essential at this time and virtually everyone will have to be moving from these fossil fuel heats, heat, so, heat systems to electric heat systems over uh, the next uh, 30 years. So let's move on to costs. Um, installation costs, so costs, there are two major costs. One is the cost of purchasing and installing the system, and the second is operational cost. So first looking at the installation costs, very rough ballpark, a single head ductless system uh, could be $6,000. Again, take all these numbers with a grain of salt, I don't know your house and what technology would be appropriate, et cetera. But that gives you an idea. And a centrally ducted system, so if you have ductwork already in your house for um, heating and possibly the ductwork for your cooling, you can use that for a heat pump and that would be roughly 15,000 to 25,000 uh, or more. Um, note that the uh, electrical service uh, very well might need to be upgraded uh, if you don't already have 200 amp service. Um, there is the 0% heat loan and in the research that we've seen, uh, this works out to be roughly comparable to the cost of installing a fossil fuel heating plus central air. So if you already have uh, central air and a fossil fuel system, you could replace both of those with a heat pump system that provides both heating and cooling. 
So now on to the operating costs. This is this graph's a little busy, uh, but it makes some important points. First, look at the kind of gray screen behind the, the colored lines. Uh, that shows you the distribution of uh, hours in the year at certain temperatures. So you see most of the year, that big kind of block of, of gray on the right side of the um, graph is uh, occurs between about 32 and 60 uh, degrees. Um, and that happens to be a great temperature for, uh, for heat pumps to operate in. Um, we do have to, of course, take care of providing heat for uh, the temperatures between freezing and, uh, and zero or minus, um, but there are not a lot of hours of the year. Um, then the colored lines show different types of heating. If you start with the yellow line on top, that's your electric resistance. The purple line is propane. The black line is heating oil. The green line is air source heat pump. The blue line is gas, and the orange line is ground source heat pump. Now this year, um, the black line and the green line may be much closer together because of the you know geopolitics that are wreaking havoc with all of the energy costs um, and uh, uh, electric prices are definitely rising um, in addition to, to heating oil costs, but um, that uh, gives you a sense of 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 the cost breakdown. And if you do have gas heat, you're now wondering, well, why would I get um, a, a, a heat pump? Um, uh, and that really just has to do with the price of gas and the price of electricity. So watch how those prices change over time, and you'll see that um, uh, you know a heat pump becomes more and more affordable. And even in this set of data, um, the space between the green lines and the blue lines is virtually nil when you get up to um, 45 degrees or so. Um, so in that shoulder season, um, your your heat pump would be just as efficient as your as your gas system. Moving on. Um, so now we're talking about incentives for uh, uh, paying for the thing. Um, and um, these include significant incentives both in Massachusetts and Rhode Island. Um, if you're integrating a heat pump with a fossil fuel system that you're going to continue to use for that, you know, those very cold days, say, you know, 32 or 45 degrees and colder, um, then that's what's called a, a, a hybrid system or an integrated system. And that's uh, the, the incentive for that is one thousand two hundred and fifty dollars per ton. Um, a ton is twelve thousand BTUs of heat. A typical home might need three to five tons of heat. Um, larger homes obviously would need more. Um, so uh, it's up to ten thousand dollars for a partial system. Uh, these do require a thermostat that connects both the systems. So it it's it it's set at a certain temperature to automatically switch from the heat pumps to the fossil fuel, um, and the technician sets that switch over point, and it's a seamless transition. Um, now in Massachusetts, there's now a whole home incentive. So if you're going to get rid of your fossil fuel system, or you can still have it, but it has to be, um, your heat pump system has to be sized to provide 100% of your uh, heating needs. Um, that that incentive is a uh, flat $10,000 per home, and you can get more information about that on the MassSave website. Gas heat is now included in the whole home uh, incentive. It didn't used to be. Uh, so that was a big change in uh, in 2022. More on incentives. You could get incentives for the ground source heat pump. Uh, that's 15,000 per home uh, for, a, for a whole home system. This is more expensive due to the site work that needs to be done on your property, but it is more efficient 
than air source, as we saw on the graph. So if you do have uh, space um, and uh, uh, you know the the capital to get into a more expensive installation, um, that is certainly a good option to explore as well. And some of the ground source uh, companies are now supplying um, financing, you know, through their own company, so you can get one for zero down uh, with a, you know, obviously with a with a payment plan. Um, there are also air to water uh, heat pumps. Now this would take heat out of the air and it would put it into a water tank that would then distribute that hot water through your home. Um, but this isn't a drop-in replacement for your boiler, fortunately. It's most applicable for radiant flooring because the temperature that the heat pump can get that hot water to is not hot enough. It's not comparable to the hot water that comes out of your boiler. It's not boiling. Um, so, um, and also there are very few in, in, uh, experienced installers uh, doing this um, hydronic replacement work. So there is an incentive for it. And um, there are people who are doing it, particularly with radiant flooring, um, but it just takes a lot more uh, planning and a lot more work to find a, a contractor who can, who can work with you. And also on uh, water heaters, there are heat pump water heaters. Again, these are two to three times more efficient than electric resistance tanks. So if you have an electric resistance tank and you're replacing it, it would be very good to, very wise to explore getting a, a hybrid or, or a 100% heat pump water heater. Uh, they do need adequate space for air exchange. You can't put this in a closet. Um, it has to be, you know, in a fairly large space. It does need electrical wiring, so if you don't currently have a circuit going to your water heater, that would be an additional uh, cost. It does need a condensate drain, um, and it does make the space colder and drier. So if you had um, a semi-finished basement, you would want to insulate the wall between the finished part of the basement and the and the heat pump water heater. And there are incentives for those as well. Now the big news uh, that we got um, uh, in August is the Inflation Reduction Act cre uh, included significant funding for heat pumps. Uh, so for instance, the federal tax credit was and is this year $300 for a heat pump install. In 2023, it will be up to $2,000. So that's great. Plus there's additional credits for electrical wiring upgrades, and there's now no lifetime cap on, on how many tax credits you can take for energy efficiency. So you can plan out 10 work, years worth of energy efficiency uh, work on your home and take that tax credit every year. The federally funded re rebates, there are two types of those. And uh, I say federally funded because the funding is going to come down to the states and the states are actually going to administer it. And we don't yet have from the states how they're going to administer that. But just to give you the overview, some of the incentives are for all income levels and some are for less than 150% of area median income. Now, just to give you a sense of what that is, in the Boston area, that's $200,000. Uh, for your household income, gross household income um, is 150% uh, percent of area median income. Uh, again, states uh, may decide to tweak their existing rebates, um, but Mike just learned today that um, Massachusetts is not going to do that. So um, uh, at least um, as far as the tax credit goes, they're not going to reduce that. Um, so, and there's a great calculator uh, on the Rewiring America site that lets you figure out which IRA uh, measures would be uh, uh, applicable to your home and your, your household. But just to give you a little more detail very quickly, and then you'll be able to see the details of this when we send out the recording of this webinar, the income qualified rebates um, are uh, for homes, as I said, up to 150% of area median income. And there's even a greater re 
re, uh, uh, incentive for households that are below 80% of area median income. Uh, there, there is all sorts of different um, things that are incentivized, electrical wiring, insulation, electric stove, electric dryer, panel upgrades, et cetera. Um, note this can't be combined with other programs. So if you got $10,000 from the state of Massachusetts, you can't also get $8,000 of this federal rebate. Um, again, the details haven't yet been spelled out, but that's my understanding at this time. The HOMES program is the program that uh, has no income restrictions. So you can be a millionaire and still get these incentives. Um, it is based on your projected energy savings of a total retrofit. So to apply for this, you need to have a professional come to your home, make a proposal, I'm going to do X, Y, and Z for your home. Here's your current energy usage. And after I do X, Y, Z to your home, this is what I project your energy usage would be. So the more energy savings are projected, the higher the level of income, uh, the higher level of uh, incentive that you would qualify for. And this does apply to uh, multifamily buildings and uh, specifically low and moderate income uh, properties um, uh, qualify for, for even greater incentives. Um, so this is a, a great opportunity. Um, let's move on to system design options. I know we're moving quickly, but we want to have time for questions. Uh, Mike, um, what if a home has ductwork already? Tell us. <clears throat> Yeah, so uh, I will say with monitoring the questions, there's a lot of questions about duct work, and we did just really highlight ductless mini splits. Uh, do know that ducted heat pumps are 100% an option. So if you already have, say, central AC, or if you already have a hot air furnace, whether it's propane, oil, or natural gas, there's likely a heat pump solution for you. Uh, the heat pump solution could either be a one from kind of the same type of manufacturer that made, say, a central AC, which could be like from Carrier or Lennox or Train, where it would just be a coil that would be sitting right on top of your fossil fuel-based system, and that can work, and that can kind of get you down to well below freezing, uh, really migrate, uh, mitigate a lot of fossil fuel use, and provide... Uh, in many cases, a much more comfortable central AC. There's also, if you do have an existing furnace and you do want to kind of get rid of that oil tank in the basement or get rid of the gas meter outside of your home, they do make centrally ducted air source heat pumps that are completely cold climate that have enough heating capacity for most average size and okayly insulated homes to get rid of the fossil fuel and switch over to a heat pump. So if you already have duct work in a lot of ways, it's a much more straightforward install um, than, if, uh, <laughs> than if your home does not have duct work, which we'll get to in a second. Uh, some other things that they do just make a note about in that slide is do know that say, let's say that your home is 100 years old and your home originally had a coal fired furnace uh, there's a good chance that, say, the duct work that was appropriate for a coal-fired furnace is not going to be uh, super appropriate for a inverter-driven modulating cold climate air source heat pump. So sometimes duct work does need to be modified to make it uh, to make it work as good as the manufacturer would like it, or to get it properly commissioned. So do you know that if you do have duct work. It's likely going to make the project a bit easier, but there, there still certainly could be things that the contractor is telling you you should do as part of the project as well to make the heat pump um, more applicable for your home. Great, thanks. And what about a home that lacks ductwork? Yeah, so if a home doesn't have duct work, then it's uh, then there's kind of two different options. So option number one would be doing what I did, where I just kind of took a couple, a handful of ductless units, and I more or less scattered them around the house, and I sized the equipment to meet my building's heat load. Uh, so say, for example, my home is 100 years old, there's no duct work, so what I ended up doing is I put a ductless unit in more or less every other room. 
Um, and that was my approach for kind of migrating completely off of natural gas. That uh, is kind of the more affordable option. Other people, their approach may be um, just putting in one big ductless unit and running the equipment like a wood stove or a pellet stove. Other people may decide if they really like, say, the idea of having a emitter or heat source or a cooling source in each and every room. It may become a matter of let me actually go and invest in my home. I'll put in a brand new duct distribution system. And then the, the even if you do start off with a boiler, you kind of end up with the same thing that you would have if you did start off with a furnace with having a ducted system. So in, in New England, installers are uh, happy to kind of work with you, figure out what your kind of goals are for the project and uh, come up with an appropriate solution. Great. Let's move on to some really uh, great examples. Um, can you walk us through these, Mike? Yeah, so on um, this example over here, this would be this would be what I would say would be appropriate for kind of the rugged New Englander. Uh, it's not probably the perfect solution for a lot of people where you're just putting in, say, one large ductless unit. This install could cost six thousand dollars and this could be enough heating horsepower for the entire home. So let's just say that the load is 15,000 BTUs, they put in an 18,000 BTU ductless unit, you just set that thing on to say 70 degrees, the family room, the kitchen, the living room area is gonna be delightful, and as you migrate further back into the bedrooms, in the summertime, depending on how well your home's insulated, depending on the windows, they may feel a little bit warm or a little bit hot. I'm not gonna say that that's going to be uncomfortable for everyone. Or say in the winter time, you migrate back into the bedrooms and on a very cold day, maybe those rooms are feeling cold. And maybe that's not a horrible idea because you like to sleep when it's a bit cooler in the bedrooms. So do know that this is a potential option, but for a lot of homeowners, this is kind of not what an installer is first gonna be proposing for the home, but do know that it is a potential option that could be explored if you do really want to kind of keep the budget in check and um, have a really nice cooling solution and migrate away from fossil fuels. And this could also be done in conjunction with uh, an existing heating system that, you know, is set so that it comes on if if it gets too cold in the bedroom sits in, right? Yeah, in 20, it's never been a better uh, better year for thermostats than 2022, uh, because now like all of the major fat manufacturers with Honeywell, Nest, Ecobee, Lux, they all have like a, a centrally located Wi-Fi thermostat that kind of remote sensors. So let's just say that the bedrooms do fall below 65 degrees and 65 degrees is kind of your comfort threshold those remote sensors could talk to the main thermostat that's in the same room as the ductless unit and even though that room's already at 70 degrees it could cause the central heating system to fire do a cycle warm up the bedrooms the mini splits still happily running uh the the heating system just ran for one or two cycles overnight uh so yeah there there's a lot of kind of good ways that can that could get configured great and for another example yeah, this is what we're trying to, <laughs> this is where I think I come in uh, the most helpful if you are kind of thinking that you're gonna have a potentially ductless project uh, or that's what you're most interested in. There's a real consequence to say the efficiency of the system with oversizing. So on the previous one, I said, it, imagine that the heat load was 15,000 BTUs. Let's say that you do want four indoor units. The smallest indoor unit, the smallest multi-zone that supports, say, like four indoor units is 36,000 BTUs. So just by the sake of, like, wanting a ductless unit in each and every room, now you've uh, kind of doubled the size of the outdoor equipment. And when the heat load is so oversized or when the equipment is so oversized versus the space that it's supposed to be going in, it does have a real impact on how efficient the equipment runs. And what I mean by that is, say that you were thinking that your heating expenditures was gonna be $2,000 over the course of the winter. If you oversize it by say 50% or 100%, you very well could end up with energy expenditures that'd be closer to like $2,500 or $3,000, depending on the manufacturer. So 
with some, uh, so sometimes there's a real penalty for kind of going with this approach. The other thing that I will say about this approach as well is the previous install probably cost about $6,000. This install is going to be costing like $22,000 or $20,000. There's, um, it's it's going to quickly, and this is just like a small studio that we're looking at. So just picture this as two stories. You know, now we're up to eight indoor units. Now it's forty thousand dollars for the equipment. So I do just try to steer people away from this. One, it affects efficiency. Two, it kind of creates these uh, proposals that some people can afford, but lots of people can't afford, even with all the great incentives and tax credits. Um, and yeah, so I, I do just think that like if you are designing with ductless, it's really important to be asking for an accurate heat load calculation from the contractor because once you have that, then these types of installs don't happen with kind of oversized equipment. Great. And that is definitely one of the things that's included when Abode does a quote comparison. They'll, they'll rate it in terms of uh, the sizing of the equipment. And now the perfect... Uh, uh, porridge uh, for Goldilocks. <laughs> Tell us about this one. Yeah, so this is kind of what we're, we're always trying to kind of guide people towards. So let's just say hypothetically that the heat load is say 15,000 BTUs per hour still. You could have a 9,000 BTU ductless unit in the living room servicing the living room, kitchen, dining room. And then you could have a 6,000 BTU ductless ducted unit up in the attic or down in the basement and having registers in the floor coming up servicing the two bedrooms in the bathroom. And I can say that this is the type of install that ends up with uh, having a coefficient of performance of or close to three or being nearly 300% efficient. It would enable you to have like the common area to be on its own zone as well as the two bedrooms to be on their own zone. So if you did like to say sleep in say 65 degree weather and you like the common area to be 70 degrees, this would be what would enable you to do it. And as far as pricing goes, I do think that most of the time I'm seeing like a small slim duct unit. I'm seeing that at like $10,000, the ductless unit $6,000. So it does come in, you know, $15,000, $16,000 for this type of setup. Uh, but I can say that the equipment's going to be running really, really well uh, as in terms of efficiency. In cooling mode, everything's going to be dry. It's going to be comfortable. Nothing's going to feel cold or clammy or humid. Uh, yeah, so, and you can even be adding, you know, adding features to especially the ducted system that could be used to really be improving the indoor air quality of the home as well. So um, that's really what we're trying to promote, but with any consultation that we're ever conducting, it really does kind of start off with just trying to think about long-term goals for the home, potential budget, what you're hoping to accomplish. And depending on that, you know, the perfect system could look wildly different than this as well. Right. Each home is unique. Yeah. Um, so just to recap. I'm going to stop it there because these uh, abode discounts are actually expired. They expired last week. This is a this is only a three week old video, but they've already expired. Um, but I do recommend that folks go to the Abode website, the Green Energy Consumers website or the Abode Energy Management website and look, you know, if you are interested in getting a quote comparison, I can vouch that they're a good, they're, it was worth my while <laughs> trying to sort between 15 different quotes. So uh, from seven different uh, manufacturers, seven different installers um, in my case, I'm a little crazy about that. <laughs> So uh, at this point, I think I'm going to stop sharing the screen and yeah, let's open up to the public for any questions. Yep, let me find this screen share thing. There it is. So if um, anyone in the public has a question, please electronically raise your hand, and I will allow you to speak. Janet McGowan. Please unmute yourself. Yes, thank you so much. I that was the most informative explanation of heat pumps that have always sort of mystified me about like how do they work. Um, one thing that just filled me with anxiety over and over was the idea of having contractors come in and give different options. Um, I live in a two hundred year old house, and you know it's actually got like a fourteen inch 
brick wall in the middle because it was built in two sections. And all I could think of was, you know, complicated equipment, a complicated situation, different options. But what really made me most anxious was getting a good contractor who's experienced. And is there any help on that front? Yeah, so this is this is a real problem, especially in Western Massachusetts. Um, Abode actually has contractors that they vetted and that they uh, work with for everywhere except Western and in the eastern part of the state. I've been pushing a little to try to get you know. To, I've been encouraging the folk that I, the guy I spoke to, spoke to there, Mike Simon, actually that you know we should get some here too. Um, it doesn't mean they're not qualified. It does mean they're not as experienced, and nobody has really looked at them yet. Um, my advice would be if you can afford to get a consultant in, Abode charges 150 bucks for a consult and they'll set you on the right path. I wish I'd done that first um, because I wasted a lot of time getting quotes for things that weren't gonna work. Um, so if you can afford that, Abode does it. There are other companies now, uh, the Zero, what is it? Zero Energy, uh, the other one I just spoke with was, um, I, I can't think of the name right now, but Abode has the best deal right now. I think we mentioned one earlier, uh, Sage Energy. Was that Ener it? Energy uh, Sage, right? Energy Sage, Dwayne, right? Mm -hmm. That is now um, trying to be, a, I don't know that they're vetting the quotes, but it's worth trying. They're, they're, they're a, like a clearinghouse for, they've been doing solar quotes. You apply to them, you say you want solar on your house and they'll get you a bunch of quotes, right? Um, they're now trying to do the same thing for heat pumps, but I don't think that solves the problem of which one of these is the right thing for my house. Um, I think for that, you got to uh, schedule a consult with a board or get somebody in um, who knows. Otherwise, um, I can tell you that there are on the Mass Save website, you, you won't go too wrong. Let me put it this way. Uh, the quotes that I've gotten only one of them was a miss. <laughs> and I literally have on my own house like 15 different quotes. Only one of them was just a miss. It wouldn't have worked. The rest of them were partial uh, home transitions. They all kept my furnace in place, which I wasn't crazy about doing, but they would have worked. So any of the mass, on the Mass Save website, there is a list of contractors that Mass Save works with and approves of. And any of those guys will do a reasonable job. They just might not do the best possible thing. Um, that's, that's what I discovered. Okay, we have another question. Um, Paul Kaplan, please unmute yourself. Uh, yeah, hi, Th thanks for, for doing this. This is gr really great. Um, I have a, a whole lot of questions. I don't wanna take everyone's time with them, but um, maybe two questions. Um, I'm kind of interested in geothermal. You said you, if you have space, enough space for it. Um, and, and all the other questions I have, uh, what's available as far as rebates and uh, ta tax write-offs. Uh, is Ab Abode qualified to give you a, a completely objective view of all of this? Or do they have a, a, an ax to grind in any particular you know, heat pump, uh, you know, any, any ax to grind at all? Abode is, a, their goal is to do the energy transition. So if anything, they'll push you toward moving away from fossil fuels faster than the contractors will, but they don't sell you anything. You're just paying for their information. So I would trust them in that sense. Uh, regarding, is that, does that answer that question? Yeah, I guess, yes, yes, perfectly. Regarding geothermal, um, I can only, I, I think there might be somebody else in this group who might be able to answer this better than me, but I can tell you that you're in the same neighborhood I'm in, Paul. So I know a little, I, I looked into it myself. And um, the problem is they need to get a ginormous drilling rig into your yard. And uh, because the rocks around here are really hard and they need these bigger rigs. They don't have tiny ones like they had when I was in Maryland uh, for digging wells. They use big rigs. And unless you have a way for them to get that into your yard, and preferably your backyard, so you're not running, presumably your furnace is at the back of the house, your duct, if you have a ducted system, um, it's at the yes, back of the house. It's probably at the back of the house. So ideally they would dig at the back of the house. Um, so that's the problem is can they get a rig in? But you should call a few companies and see what they say. Um, okay. Anyone else have a comment about you? 
it is the best way to go if you can afford it and get a rig on your property, but. Um, Are there any other questions? And, and Laurie, can you uh, address the next education series on heat pumps? Uh, when people are well, we don't have it scheduled for sure yet, but we're hoping on one of the things that you absolutely have to do if you're gonna get a heat pump is make sure that your house is nice and tight. I, I'm guilty of not having done as much as I could there yet um, myself. Uh, it's ongoing for us, you know, if you're a homeowner or a renter for that matter, it's an ongoing struggle to keep your windows and doors and walls and everything else tight. Um, so, you know, the next, the next edu in the education series uh, will hopefully be on envelope, what we call envelope issues, right? Getting the envelope of your house battened down, <laughs> um, you know, so, so that there's as little heat leak as possible. Um, so we'll be talking about that hopefully on December 7th at 5.30. Thanks, Laurie. And thank you for the questions. Yeah. Okay, let's move on to the next part of the agenda. We don't have a lot of time. Stephanie, I don't know if you want to um, address any updates that you have. The only one that I have really relevant um, to the education series is that I spoke to the communications um, director, and we're going to create um, on your web page uh, kind of a folder that will have all of the education um, events in one folder. So That's they'll awesome. be titled and numbered and um in an order so seeing that we only have two so far we're going to try to get on that tomorrow that's great thanks stephanie sure okay any ecat member updates no okay um all right uh, the items for our next meeting we're going to have a conversation about the home rule petition Andra, if you can send us any information uh, on that, and then we do want to take a, a vote on that based on the conversation we have. And then um, the same agenda is today around setting priorities for the town council and town manager. I'll send information over to Stephanie and what Anna had sent, and then um, Stephanie's response and mine as well. So I'll send it over to Stephanie, and she can share with all of you. Uh, just keep in mind around the pillars that you have, the items in the carp, and see what do we need to push the town to address as part of their goals for FY23. Um, anything else that we need to talk about the next meeting? Other so the next meeting is scheduled time? for the 23rd, Vasu, and that's the day before Thanksgiving. <laughs> so I'm not sure if you all are planning to meet or your next meeting will be December 7th. So you should decide. Yeah, I'm glad you brought it up because I'm out. Um, do we want to have a meeting the week after? The way we're not missing this meeting? Either one would be okay with me. So the 30th instead of the 23rd? Will that work for everybody? Would that be then the, the 30th and the 7th, or would yeah. we be shifting our entire two week? No, it'll just be back to back for. Yeah. Okay. Because Laurie's working on the December 7th education series. So I want to keep that December 7th meeting. Uh, yeah. And I'm looking forward to Dwayne's uh, presentation on the solar hosting tool. So I, okay. yeah, I'd be in favor of those two meetings, moving the next meeting to the 30th. Yeah, I can plan to do that on the. 30th. Yeah, I, I wouldn't be able to do it the day before Thanksgiving. <laughs> okay. I, we'll I have that. One too. <laughs> Sounds like the 30th. Okay. Okay. All right. So the next meeting is November 30th. All right. And I don't think we need any additional public comments unless, um, unless the public has additional comments that they want to talk about outside of the heat pump conversation that we had. If anyone has any comments, please digitally raise your hand and I'll unmute you. And Stephanie, can you note how many attendees there has been? 12 total. 12. Okay, thank you. Okay, great. All right, we can adjourn then. Thank you all for your time. Lori, thank you for setting this up. Appreciate it. Bye folks. Bye. Great job, Lori. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Seriously, love it.